foresters had a reputation for cruel tyranny. To them, wrote the monk Adam of Ancient, violence is law, pillage is praiseworthy, justice is hateful, innocence is guilt. From their evil ferocity, no rank or condition of man, save the king himself, can escape unharmed. The foresters hunted down anyone who broke the law and brought them to trial. The Queen's house in the New Forest has been the site of a forest court for nearly 800 years. One surprising remnant from the savage forest laws of the medieval period is this stirrup. Its purpose was to measure the size of dogs. Every dog in the royal forest would have to pass through this stirrup. Its head and its whole body would have to get through. Yo-Yo is obviously not going to make it. If the dog was too big, its toes would be cut off to prevent it hunting the royal deer. For humans, it was even crueler. For killing a heart or a hind, the punishment was blinding, castration or death. The writer John of Salisbury voiced the hatred of ordinary people for the forest laws. Although man is created in the image of him who made all things from nothing, kings regard the beasts of the earth more highly than man. How many wretches have they hanged on the gallows for taking the flesh of wild animals? They do not fear to ruin a man on account of a beast. The brutality of these laws caused great bitterness amongst the thousands excluded from the forest. Human beings might be unequal, but it was still thought there was something cruelly unjust in this shutting out of the natural world to all except the very rich. In 1209, one man who had killed a deer, Hugh the Scot, was pursued by foresters. He fled to the sanctuary of the local church. The foresters wanted him to stand trial. If they'd succeeded, it would have meant the gallows. He hid there for a month. Then he disappeared in disguise. He was never seen again. Running away from the courts took a man into dangerous territory. From that moment on, he was an outlaw, someone literally outside the law, a non-person. He was known as Wulves Heved, Wolf's Head, because like the wolves of the forest, there was no punishment for taking his life. Outlaws turned to robbery to survive. Some became heroes, glorified in stories and songs. Come all you outlaws, come off with me, to the green wood of Belregard, where men can live free. Trees and wild animals and the cool of the shade, far from the courts where the laws are made. The reality for an outlaw was very different. Trial and certain death were never far away. It was a severe and rigid system. Everyone had their place. The law dictated how you lived and even where you could go. The lives of those who worked had little in common with the lives of the ruling classes. Serfs bound to their lord's estates, Outlaws treated like wolves. Forest dwellers killed for hunting. And yet, there is no record of major popular insurrections or revolts at this time. There was a very good reason why. Wherever you looked, the landscape was being transformed. 
the country was a building site. Forbidding structures were taking shape all over Europe. The peasant class was being drafted to construct buildings designed to oppress them. From 1066, England belonged to one man, the invading Norman king, William the Conqueror. He parceled out the country to the leading families who had fought for him. To control their enormous estates, they built the first stone castles in England. They were the power bases of the second order of society, the military aristocracy. The medieval world was studded with castles, hundreds of them, the bones of the kingdom, as one contemporary called them. They were built to be high, to act as giant watchtowers over the surrounding countryside, to see and to be seen. A stone castle like this would be the biggest, most expensive, and most threatening building you'd be likely to see in your life. It was a symbol of the power of the aristocracy, the center of their great estates, and the foundation of their military might. The Great Hall was the center of aristocratic life, where nobles would sit in the midst of family, servants, entertainers, and dogs, in surroundings of luxury unimaginable to the peasantry. What they were used to were houses made of mud and timber. Castles like Headingham were the visible symbols of the knight's right to rule. This international class of fighting men, the aristocracy, regarded themselves as a different breed from the peasants who served them. The word aristocracy means, as medieval scholars knew, rule by the best people. Quite simply, the nobles saw themselves as a better class of being. If land gave them their power, it was their blue blood that entitled them to it. Binding the aristocratic fighting class was a code of honor, the code of chivalry. The origins of chivalry had little to do with gallantry and romance. It was a code of conduct that protected the aristocratic families at the expense of everyone beneath them. Above all, chivalry was a form of caste solidarity the glue that held the warring class together. This is how the Catalan knight, Ramon Lull, describes the chivalric code. According to him, after protecting God and the king, the knight's next duties are to go hunting, give lavish feasts, and fight in tournaments. After that, he must ensure that he terrorizes the peasantry. For because of the dread that the common people have of the knights, they labor and cultivate the earth for fear lest they be destroyed. But the central duty of the knight was to go to war. In exchange for their castles, lands and peasants, this class not only controlled the population, but would be expected to fight for the king. For them, war was the natural state of life and warfare was ennobling. It was in war that they could win honor, riches, and even more land. Medieval knights lived for the glory of the battlefield. I love the gay Easter tide which brings forth leaves and flowers, and I love the joyous songs of the birds echoing through the copse.